Absolutely everything about this night had them on edge. They all knew someone was about to get murdered. They just didn't know how many of them. The assassination's already been planned. And the little band of men has now moved deep inside the enemy territory. From this point on, everything changes. The entire script is flipped upside down. Everything becomes cloak and dagger. Two of you now will go inside the enemy's headquarters. And the tiny group hold their breath. And the leader picks out two. I want you to make your way into the city, blend in with the crowd. Try not to be seen. Get inside the main gate and wait. I've got someone on the inside. They're going to be carrying a jug of water. It'll be a man. Follow him inside the gates. Get in deep into the enemy's territory. He'll lead you to a house, but don't speak a word until you get there. When he stops at the door, ask for the owner. He'll take care of the rest. And silence fills the small circle of men. The two that he picks stare, unblinking. And he nods, simply as if to say, you have your orders. And they slip away from the other 10, and they start to walk. Cloaks are pulled down tight, just above the eyebrows. Eyes are kept at the cobblestone. They don't want to catch any glances, dare not to be recognized on this mission. And as they make their way into the crowd, they stand against the city gates. They put their back against the large stone walls, and they wait. Water jug, woman. Water jug, woman. Another water jug carried by a woman. And I wonder if their minds start to race. It was just a few days ago they came through this gate. It was just a few days ago everything they had dreamed of, all of their hopes, all their desires seemed to come rushing in in one single parade. Two were also picked. Hard to tell if it was the same but an incredibly different scene. This time in the broad daylight, this time amongst the little city that has swelled over 20 times its normal population. You see in the first century in Israel, everybody wants to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. Every good Jewish family wants to make their way and have that same dinner, the same dinner, the same lamb, the same bowls, the same dishes, the same cups that everyone in the entire nation will be celebrating. Everyone wants to do it in the capital. Everyone wants to go back to that time, to that place, 1,400 years previously, where your nation, Israel, found themselves enslaved in the greatest nation in the world, Egypt. And when you cried out to your God, God brought the greatest nation to its knees. He brought plague after plague after plague, 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 plague. Still, the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, said, you're not taking my slaves. And Moses says, has your wish. There's one more plague. And if this is what it takes for God to get your attention, this one's going to hurt. And Moses goes back and he tells all the Israel, the Hebrew people, every family has to kill a lamb, put blood over the door of your house, and then lock yourself inside. Tonight, an angel of death is going to come over the land. If he sees blood on your doorpost, he will pass over your house. No one will be hurt. But if there is no blood of this lamb that you killed on your doorframe, the firstborn will die. And that night, Egypt, the most powerful nation, loses its firstborn. And that next morning, Pharaoh says, get up and get out. And God moves his people out of the land. And for 1,000 450 some years, this nation once a year has been celebrating the passing over. Every family once again will kill a lamb. It must be roasted over an open flame, not boiled. Every dinner table in every Jewish home will be set the exact same way. The lamb will be at the center. There will be a little bowl of bitter herbs and a dish of salt water. You take the bitter herbs and you dip them in salt water and you eat them. It's to remind you of the bitterness of slavery, the tears that were shed when you left Egypt. 
There's a little bowl, a mixture of raisin, dut, cinnamon, and it looks like, it looks like mud. It's a reminder that your people once made bricks. There's bread that didn't have time to rise. It is flat, it is broken, to remind you that your people had to run out of the country in haste. They just took what they had with them. No preparation. And there's a cup, a cup that one day, one day this God that once showed up and saved your people will one day come back and finish the job once and for all. One day this God will show up and save. And for 1,400 years, your people have been waiting. You're tired of being pawns, a little tiny sliver of land being traded by the world empires. You're tired of being slaves by Egypt, by the Babylonians, by the Syrians, by the Persians, by the Greeks, and now by the great Roman Empire. And on this day, in this time, in this week, in this city, everyone has come to this city, and everyone will sit at the table, and everyone will once again look at the blood of a lamb, and everyone will have the exact same routine, and everyone will say the exact same phrases, and everyone will have the exact same cup, and something will be different this year. There'll be whispers, there'll be murmurings, people will go off script, people will talk about him, him, for three years. He seems to fit the definition. For three years, with words, he has been healing people. People have come up with leprosy, those with the sick, oozing pus, infection and sores on their body, and he will reach out a finger and touch the infection, and molecules will rearrange themselves, and skin will be made new. Rumor has it, he can walk on water without the use of anything, as if waves and molecules of H2O obey. He can speak and winds and storms listen. He's walked inside the home where the 12 year old girl has died. He slips around the embrace of a father that has showed up with help way too late. A mom that buries her head in her husband's large chest Dad will grab wife by the back of the neck, the small of the waist, and for the first time, see his sixth grader lifeless. And Jesus will slip around the side and touch the cold fingers and say, Talitha Kaume, little girl, it's time to get up. <laughs> Breath comes back into her body. He helps her sit to the side of the bed. Mom and dad are filled with, mom and dad are filled with, uh, oh, we don't have adjectives for this moment. Is it shock? Is it joy? Is it disbelief? Is it horror? Is it fright? Is it amazement? Is it awe? And in that silence, he simply says, don't tell anyone outside she died. Protect her. He will walk through cities and people will call his name. Blind men will be ushered toward him. And on the road he will stop and he will look at them and <coughs> he will spit his loogie and put it in the dirt. He will make mud. He will put it on the blind man's eyes and sight is restored. It's, it's, it's not just the miracles, it's not the power, it's the teaching. Not the type of teaching for the non-intellectual. Not the type of teaching for those that are weak-minded. Not the type of teaching for those of you that need a crutch to get through life on. But the type of teaching that big barrel-chested grown men who move large wooden ships by hand for a living sit and listen and say, that's what I've been waiting for. That makes sense, not just in here, but up here. That's the type of guy I can follow. For three years, the stories have been building and building and building. 
And as two men wait, watching for water jugs, I wonder if the memories all come racing through. Just a few days ago, they come to that city. He grabs two. He said, I want you to go in. This time, we're entering this city different than anyone. You two, go in the city, mix with the crowd. The first donkey you see, untie it, bring it back. If someone goes, hey, that's my donkey, just say, the master needs it, and take off. Are you kidding me? I've heard the Easter story my entire life at church. I never had a Sunday school teacher tell me that Easter started with a carjacking. I mean, it wasn't big, it was a donkey, it was like a little, he didn't like steal a Clydesdale, not like an Escalade, he didn't steal a Mustang like a, a Mustang. He picked a donkey, like Jesus goes green, it's like a Prius, he's going to ride in on a Prius. And the crowd that has swelled into the city. And for the acres and acres outside the walls of those that are camping just to have their meal close to the city, they see him now above riding in, and it's what they've been waiting for. This guy can fulfill the cup. Roman guards are doubled, tripled, quadrupled during this time. This little city is at a fever pitch, it's at a frenzy. Spiritualism, nationalism, everything is boiling over. And with the electricity in the crowd, someone fills their lungs with air and shouts it out. Hosanna! And electricity hits the thousands. As armed guards look for who the corporate was from the other side of the crowd, it's yelled out and echoed back, Hosanna! And they pick it up. Hosanna! 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 Two little Hebrew words to save now. Save now, save now, save now. The 12 disciples gather on the donkey. Their eyes are wide. The hair in the back of their neck is standing up. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what it's all about. Save now, save now. As if the crowd needed any more motivation, somewhere from the back she yells, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's an eruption of cheers. To come in the name of someone means to come in their power and their might. Save now, save now, bring the power of God. Save now, save now, bring the power of God. And I imagine by the time they reach the city, somewhere from an upper floor in the walls, he lets it scream. Blessed is the coming kingdom of David! And it's like a spark on a powder keg. And the entire town erupts. The last time you had freedom, political might, was a kingdom under a family name of David. Save now, save now, bring the power of God. Save now, save now, set up a kingdom. And in the course of the last three days of teaching, things have changed. That little parade and the cheers, Jesus has led to the temple. It's toward the end of the day now, and he walks in there. The religious leaders hate him. They put a price on his head. He walks into the enemy's headquarters simply to look around. Doesn't say a word. And after he has the eyes and the full attention of everyone in the temple, he turns and walks out. (laughs) Are you kidding me? One of the most boldest moves in all of history. Just to show yourself to the enemies. I don't know if you guys heard the cheers from outside. I know you've been looking for me. I'm in town. I'll be here all week. I'll see you in the morning. (laughs) And in the last three days, he hasn't killed a single Roman. There's been no plagues. 
He's not the hero this city was waiting for. And the crowds begin to turn. And two of them now are sent in with no parade, cloaks down, water jug. Man, this week has gone south. Water jug. What in the world has happened since the parade? Water jug, guy. They slip out in the crowd, those making last minute preparations for the dinner. They follow through Main Street, three blocks. It's a quick two blocks to the right. The roads get narrow, smaller. They're more of passageways more than anything else. And the remnant of the Middle Eastern sun, all you smell is body odor and sweat and people and humanity. And they're shoulder to shoulder, sandal to sandal, making their way, keeping their eye on the water jug. One more click to the right. And then the water jug is put down on the step of a house. A door is open, it's taken inside and it's shut. And the two now, it's time for the line. And they'll walk up and knock. Door will crick open. Can we talk to the owner? There's indistinct murmuring in the background. An elderly man appears and they simply say, master wants to know if a room is ready. And the owner quickly looks up and down the street both directions. Did anybody just hear? He'll be harboring a fugitive this night with a price on his head. If he's found at his house, his wife and children may die. But no one seems to have noticed. So with a nod, he takes him around the side, up the stairway. It's a large house inside the city. There's a second floor big enough for dinner for 13. Most of the preparation is on the table. He apologizes for what hasn't been set up. I'm sure he'll take care of the rest. And I'm sure he adds, I promise no one will know that you're here. And as quickly as he let him up, he leaves. And two of the 12 finish the rest of the table. And under nightfall, one by one, the rest of the disciples approach. Everyone will enter the room the exact same way. Everyone will go up the steps, open the door, stop. Look at the floor, look at the table, look back at the floor and have a decision to make. And they'll go to the table. And the next disciple walks in and he pauses, floor, table, floor, and he moves. And the next disciple walks in and he pauses. And the next disciple walks in and he stutter steps, floor, table, table. Where you sit at the table determines everything. Jesus will have his place. The first one to his right will be the most important guy in the room. The first one to his left will be the second most important guy in the room. The second person to his right will be the third most. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight. They'll make their way to 12 and all of them walk in the door and they will pause and they will look at the seats that are being taken and they'll quickly try to find the best one. And in only the way scripture can, the lens of the Bible has rushed us into the first few days in this city, Jerusalem, at that time, at that week, and we pick up the story in John chapter 13. I know you're sitting there going, I thought you were going to close in prayer. You're just now getting to the Bible. Oh, get comfy, kids. John chapter 13. Here we go. You got a Bible? Open your own flat screen. I'll wait. This book's really important. If you don't have a Bible, share with someone next to you. They have to. It's a Christian conference. John chapter 13, you go to the back of the Bible, look for the guys' names, they're pretty big, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John 13. Or go to the front page of your Bible, God wrote a table of contents just because he knew he was going to write a big book. Find what page number John is on. Go to chapter 13. Old chubby guy needs two things, a sweat hanky and glasses. Here we go. Now it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now shows the full extent of this love that we talked about last night, of this love that we heard about this night, of this love last night that we heard about, a God that enters, a God that came to you of this love that you might not be able to hold in a cup or a bowl or see, but the tangible evidence. Let me show you the full extent of this love that we saw entered into our conference last night. The evening meal was already being, I realize this is a monologue and I've been having a lot of dramatic pauses, sorry about that. Here's what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna stop and if you know the next word, I'm, I'm, you go ahead and say it. The evening meal was already being, 
Okay, the uh, 4,280 of you without a Bible, now at least you've heard the word. So if you heard it, it starts with an S, ends in Irv correctly. We can all do this together. The evening meal has already been? The evening meal has already been? And they all flunked their final exam. And Jesus knows it. The evening meal has already been. And the devil has already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus, however, knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, circle, highlight, underlying. Jesus knew who he was, where he was coming from, and where he was going. He knew he had the power of God, knew he came from God, knew he was returning to God. So, this is what you do when you know who you are, that you are God's, and that you're returning to God. So. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And now we know what every one of them knew, what in our Western American culture most of us miss in reading this story, they blew it. Every disciple, when they walked in the door, would look down and immediately on the floor, there's a pitcher of water, a bowl or basin, and a towel. And as they got to the room that night, they looked down, saw it, stuttered, paused, saw the table, and sat. All 12 of them walked in, saw it, table, and sat. Walk in, it's there. I'm going here, every one of them. The time's over, the exam's over. The Bible makes that clear. The evening meal has already been. The time for the washing of the feet is over. In a house inside the city, inside the gated community, a two-story house in the first century, a second floor that is enclosed, large enough to have dinner for 13. Oh, this is the wealthiest of the wealthiest, my friends. Every disciple spending that day in sandals. Every disciple walking with open-toed shoes. Every disciple following the tracks of tens of thousands that have flooded in the city. The amount of lambs that have been taken into the city to be sacrificed. The human waste, urine, feces, that because of lack of understanding of disease in the first century and no plumbing has been thrown into open roadways. The muck, the mire, the crap that is collected in your toes and feet. You do not carry that into a wealthy house in the gated community. The moment you step into that house, there will be a pitcher of water, a wash basin, and a towel, and the lowest slave in the family will be sitting. He's the crap boy. You will offer him your foot. He will untie your laces. He will gently hold you by the back of the ankle and calf. He will pour water over. He will wash the crap between your toes. He will dry them on his lap with the towel, and you will offer the second. And you will put your crap on him, and he will untie it. He will wash it. He will take all of your crap, and he will let you walk in clean. But you see, the evening meal has already been. The time for foot washing has long passed. Oh, they'll go to a garden tonight. Guards will come tonight. Jesus will be beaten and bludgeoned tonight. And I wonder if the first drops of Jesus' blood 
were spilt at that table and swallowed as the Son of God sat there and bit his lip, watching every disciple walk past that station, hoping that one of you got this right. Please tell me one of you guys have gotten the last three years. But everyone wants to know where they sit one through 12. And he waits, and he waits, but now the evening meal has been served. So he will push away, and he will walk to the door. He will take off his outer cloak. He will wrap the towel around his waist. He will grab the water and the basin. And as he turns to the table, you could have heard a pin drop. Every follower is thinking the exact same thing. Oh God, don't give it to me. Oh God, don't give it to me. Oh, please don't make me number 12. Please don't make me number 12. Please don't make me number 12. And the electricity that shattered every molecule in that room when the Son of God, the creator that spoke things into being, when his knees hit the floor and he kneels and he takes the first ankle and he starts to untie and he grabs the water and he pours. And he starts taking their crap. To the next foot. And the next foot. And the next foot. And the amount of astonishment and horror in the room cannot be calculated. He just made himself 13. And he made his way to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand you don't get discipleship yet. You failed the final exam. No way, said Peter. You're, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus simply answered, unless I wash you, you don't have any part with me. Well, then... Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said, look, a person who's already had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. Peter, you already showered. Let's not get carried away with this. This is about washing your feet. It's about all of you being clean. Not quite every one of you. Because I know, and Judas knows, what the rest of you don't know yet. But I'll wash his feet too. You see, he knew he was going to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, and the room is silent. Do any of you understand what this was about? Silence. So he breaks it down. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, that is who I am. But now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have just given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater 
than his master. Circle, highlight, underline. No servant is greater than his master. In fact, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you can do these things. Do you have any clue what this is about? I know. None of you remember the stories on the road. None of you remember Mark chapter nine, the first time I grabbed the 12 of you together and said, let me tell you the plan. Everyone wants a hero. Everyone's gonna chant, save our life. Everyone's gonna chant, bless me. I haven't come to bless you. I've come to die for you. The crowd doesn't get that. I want at least you 12 to get that. Here's how, here's how I'm gonna change your life. We're gonna go into the enemy's territory. In fact, I'm gonna walk into their headquarters. I'm gonna turn myself in. I'm gonna allow them to take me, mock me, spit on me, beat me, bludgeon me, whip my back wide open. I'm gonna allow them to put me on a cross. I'm gonna allow them to kill me. But you listen, listen, listen. After three days, I'm gonna pull off Easter. That's the plan. And they're speechless. Well, we want you to bless our life not sacrifice something, and they walk on. When they get to the house, he goes, by the way, what were you guys talking about on the road? And no one said a thing because they were arguing about who was through. I had to do it your way because I realized my way doesn't. They were arguing about who was one through 12. The son of God for the first time just told you the plan about dying and you're arguing about one through 12? How stupid do you have to be to be a disciple? The creator of the universe took on flesh The creator became creation so you can understand, recognize, so he could speak your language, you could speak his language, to model and show us how to live, to die for us, to take our crap, to cleanse us, not just so that we are forgiven, so that his spirit after Easter could inhabit us, and you want to know how it's going to pay off for you? How dumb do you have to be to be a disciple? He goes, you guys don't get this plan. James and John come up to him and go, yeah, we do. Can you, can, can we talk to you? Can we, J-Dog, can we have you for a second? Come here, come here. Hey, guys, seriously, can you give us just a second? Just, James and I have something, thanks. All right, Jesus, um, we're going to ask you something. Can you promise you do it? <laughs> Which is always a great way to start prayer. And Jesus goes, what are you guys thinking? They're like, we want to be number one and number two. Or number one and number two, we're brothers, we're good with it. And Jesus goes, you guys don't have a clue what you're asking. And they're like, oh, yeah, we do. Our mom's in on it. (laughs) You really think Jesus Christ came to bless your life? And they're like, well, yeah, you got power. So he pulls the entire group together. And in Mark chapter 10, when the other 10 disciples find out what James and John just took seats number one and two, they became angry with them. So Jesus called all of them together, said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over people, and their high officials exercise authority over people. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm tired of explaining this to you. Let's go to Jerusalem. I will set up a final exam. I will leave the pitcher, the basin, and the towel by the door. Please tell me one of you gets this. You are calling yourself a Christian, one who is like Christ, but you live like the world. You expect to be served. You expect to be blessed. You expect whatever title, position, prestige, popularity you have to have people look up to you and serve you. 
He goes, that is how Gentiles, the world thinks. From now on, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, not so with you. Yeah, you're still clueless. All right, let me speak your language. From now on, I want you to be great. In fact, every room, every friendship, every time you ever walk in anywhere, every circle you're ever in, I want you to consider yourself the greatest person there. Now am I speaking your language? Okay, good, let me go on. I want you to put yourself first above everybody else. I want you to put yourself first in every single thing you do. Now we're communicating? Good. Let me just take greatness and being first as a definition. Let me flip it upside down for you. I want you to be great, the greatest. And I want you to be first. I'll speak your language. But you will use my definition. Greatness means you will be least. And by number one, I want you to be slave. And by the way, slave to all. Have you seen my life these last three years? I am the son of the almighty God. I am the word that spoke things to the human being. I am the big bang that science talks about but cannot divine but recognizes. I am the source of the universe and all of life that started in one point at one time and it was my words so I can redefine greatness. And first, and even though that is who I am, did you ever see me demanded to be served? If I, your God, came to serve others, you will serve, or you will stop using my name as a mockery. Do not call yourself a Christian if it is to be blessed and to gain power. Knock it off. Now go be great. Be number one. And his final act to show the full extent of that was kneeling and taking those that don't get him, those that don't understand him, those that will run from him, those of you that will come back just to curse me three times. And those of you that will help drive the nails into my flesh. I have come to kneel to serve. And if you can't do this, well then apparently you think you're greater than your God, aren't you? Do you understand what I've just done? I made myself 13. You will be blessed if you can do this. And if you can't humble and serve, then walk out with the rest of the crowd who loves raising their hands to Jesus and singing, bless our life, bless our life, come with power, bless my life, bless my life. And I promise you, this God will not show up. And in a matter of days, months, or years, you put your faith in him, 
You tried him. You may not say it out loud, but you will have a lifestyle that simply says, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He didn't answer my prayers. He didn't save mom and dad's marriage. I still had to go to a funeral. He hasn't changed me. Bless our life. Bless our life. I am so sorry if you grew up in a church like I did and someone told you Jesus died on the cross because he loved you and that if you say a prayer, he will come in and be part of your life. It is a lie from the pit of hell. I promise you, Jesus will never, ever be part of your life. He will take all of it, or he will take none of it. He is God, you are not. He will not be part of your show. He did not come to bless your hopes and dreams. He came to change your life, not bless it. And he did it by kneeling Philippians 2, he kneeled to God just to come to earth. Even though he was God, he did not consider his equality with God something to be grasped. But he laid it aside. He sat down being God, coming to earth, taking on the nature of a man, one of his own creation, to walk among us, to kneel, to surrender in the boldest move of all of history, to the point of even giving himself. He goes, now you are allowed to be called by my name. You can be called a Christian. That is not a religion. That is not a church you go to. That is not a set of beliefs you adhere to. You are allowed to be called a Christian. He goes, but I define the word. You will serve. You will go home and serve your parents, and I don't care who they are. I wash Judas' feet. You will go home and serve your little brother and sister who annoy the heck out of you. And there you're Judas, and I washed his feet. And you will serve. And if you think Christianity is about making you great, not so with you, I redefine greatness. I have so many people at church and students come up and ask about the Holy Spirit. When people talk about the Holy Spirit in your life, how do you know the Holy Spirit's in our life? Oh, let me tell you, the moment you understand the posture of kneeling, the moment you understand the posture of serving, you will encounter the Holy Spirit. You will never, ever, ever be closer to the Spirit of God than when you are serving. But let let me promise you this. You will never, ever be further from the Spirit of God than when you are expecting to be served. Because you are never more like Jesus than when you're serving. And you are never more opposite Jesus than when you expect others to serve you. You want to walk in the Spirit, take a knee, surrender, throw out the white flag, tap out. He will not ever be part of your life. But the amazing mystery, unexplainable love of God is that in spite of you and your crap and what you brought in here, he will take all of you, all of you. And he hasn't come to bless your life. He's come to take your life and change it. And until you understand the posture of kneeling and the boldness of that move, I promise you, you will be a clueless disciple that is wondering where you fit one through 12. And given enough time, you will stop chanting Hosanna, and you will start chanting crucify him. This God didn't work. He didn't answer my prayers. I find him no good for me anymore. It was that way 2,000 years ago. It's that way today. The choice is still yours. Father, may we be a people that stop chanting, bless our life. And may we be a people that simply come and say, change our life. May we understand the boldness in that posture of kneeling is serving and surrender. 
And later that night, you will once again in the garden drop a knee and you will surrender your hopes, your dreams, and you will take a cross that you do not want to take simply as last night, that greatest act of love. Forgive us for thinking you will be part of our life. Forgive us for thinking that you would be a God happy of being part of anything we do. And God, may we kneel, may we surrender, may we tap out, and may we serve. And in serving God, may you give us your spirit, your strength that makes this life possible, not ours, not our own. May you find us, God, faithful. May you find us broken. May you find us kneeling. In Jesus' name, amen.